Thanks for taking time to listen to this episode of The Real Rescue Podcast. Take a minute to go to therealrescue.com to check out these and other great deals from our sponsors here at The Real Rescue. This episode of The Real Rescue Podcast is brought to you by Breeze Eastern, the world's only dedicated helicopter hoist and winch provider. SR3 Rescue Concepts, because you don't know what you don't know. And rescueswimmershop.com, official high quality apparel featuring the silhouette. Breeze Eastern, they dedicate themselves to our helicopter rescue world. Since the very first helicopter rescue in November of 1945, Breeze Eastern has designed and manufactured superior rescue hoist solutions. While much of the technology and the unique mission requirements have changed over the past 75 years, their commitment to the rescuers, the operators, and those being rescued has not. Contact them today by visiting them at breeze-eastern.com. SR3 Rescue Concepts is a training company that can help your helicopter training. They train daytime, nighttime, aerial firefighting, hoist, longline, fast rope, rappel, and more. They can assist your program with standardization and safety checks or just an FAA annual refresher. With the certified flight instructor pilots and experienced crew, they are ready to help your agency keep up to date with current techniques, rules, regulations, and equipment. Plus, right now, SR3 is offering 10% off anything in their web store with the promo code, all capital letters, Real Rescue, R E A L R E S Q. Plus, they are offering 10% from their partners, Petzl and their equipment, all you got to do is send an email to info at sr3rescueconcepts.com. Mention this podcast, The Real Rescue Podcast, and they'll take care of the rest. 15 years ago, photographer and Coast Guard rescue swimmer number 526, Chris Razor, created an iconic photograph. This photograph depicted the silhouette of a helicopter rescue swimmer reaching down for an outstretched hand in need against the American flag backdrop. The image went viral and became a symbol worldwide for the rescue community and the people they help. Its wild popularity inspired Chris to launch RescueSwimmerShop.com, a web store offering official high quality apparel featuring his evocative image, The Silhouette. T-shirts, hats, patches, and stickers featuring the silhouette are available at RescueSwimmerShop.com, including the flagship design, So Others May Live. Follow Chris and his story on Instagram with the handle at RescueSwimmerShop. And if you are a rescue swimmer, support rescue swimmers, or just tell people you are one at the bar, this gear is definitely for you. When you get to the website, rescueswimmershop.com, enter the promo code, all lowercase, one word, rescue, R-E-S-C-U-E, for 10% off your order. Those of us in the rescue world do and see a lot of crazy stuff. You never actually know how you're going to handle it until you're there. Well, in this episode of The Asterix, we sit down with United States Coast Guard Rescue Swimmers number 122 and 126, Mr. George Cavallo and Olaf Lavelle. And they sit down with us to talk about leadership and critical incident stress management, what to do, how to help your guys, how to be a good leader, what happens when you have a big case, and how to recover to get your guys back up to speed as quickly as possible. In addition to that, we talk about having open communication. And I will say for myself, for anybody that's out there that's having a hard time with things they've seen or things they've gone to, please send me an email. I'm happy to sit down with you and talk to you about it and help you get through it. My name is Jason Quinn. I am United States Coast Guard Rescue Swimmer number 500. These are my rescues and rescues from those of us that put our lives on the line every day so others may live. This is The Real Rescue Podcast.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Real Rescue Podcast. Today, I've got with me two guys that you guys have already heard. I'm super pumped to have them back. Mr. George Cavallo and Mr. Olaf Lavelle, rescue swimmer number 126 and 122. What's up, fellas? Hey, what's going on? on? Good to be back. So I'm, I'm totally yeah, pumped to have you guys back, here. Ha- hell yeah. Uh, so, but this one's going to be an, a, a little different episode for everybody out there. Uh, so we're making this an asterisk episode because a lot of the stuff that we do in our career as far as rescue swimmers, and I'll throw this out to other medical first responders um, and even infantry guys, guys that are in special forces, we see some stuff that most people don't see and can't quite understand. Um, but I want to talk about two things with these guys and, and we're going to enlighten a whole bunch of this because these two guys were my first leaders in my rescue swimmer shop. So I came in as a boot third, uh, junior rescue swimmer rookie year. And I had these guys as my leaders to mentor. And so we're going to talk a little bit of leadership today, and then we're going to get into a little bit of PTSD, the, uh, or the SISM training, the critical incident stress management stuff, because a lot of the cases that we see nowadays it's and we're going to talk about this a little bit later it's uh you know there's more help with that than there was back in the day when the program first started so anyway what's up fellas that's what i did get into it and i'm sure olaf and i are going to be uh fighting back and forth here you know like we did our whole career you know it was kind of interesting because we graduated school together and through our whole career, we were competing with each other, but helping each other. Like, like yeah. when he made rank, I was excited. Other. Or when I made first class before he did, I'll just throw that out there. He was excited. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, he made senior what was that, like, chief. Six, I made chief. You, you lived a lifetime so, of that six days he got ranked. <laughs> <laughs> so, but no, you know, it was really good because it was a healthy uh competitiveness that that drove both of us but also we were excited when the other one um got promoted and then the stars just aligned and and put us in kodiak alaska um where he was the senior chief and i was the chief a brand new chief actually yeah well it it didn't start off that way george it was i went there as the chief and you went there as actually as a first class and i made senior chief there and you made chief and uh it was a good transition it was it was hard on you in the beginning, uh, going from going from cool guy George, you know, first class petty officer Cavallo, then all of a sudden he's a chief, where his his word is the law. Well, you know that's and, a uh, problem you too, because job. a lot of times they want to transfer you to a new unit where you become chief. And yeah. uh, but then it was a unique situation because Olaf had been a chief for a few years, so. I had this built in mentor and, you know, we were really good friends. So, and we'll talk more about that, but it was, it was a really neat um, uh, way that it all came. Yeah. The way it all came together and, and, at, at Kodiak, which is one of the premier stations to be at. Well, like I said, I mean, when I showed up there. Yeah. Oh, heck yeah. Uh, When I showed up. Well, I'm talking about like us as all of us, like you too, Jason, like when we, when, like we were talking about the other, at the last podcast with me, like it, the stars were just aligned. I mean, I, I, I can't say that enough about from, from George and I all the way down to the, to you as the new third class to the commands to, it was just, it was just paramount. We, we had the best of everything right then. Yeah. Everything was great. I, it was a, it was an amazing first unit for me, uh, hands down, like out of every place I've been in the world, that was still one of the, premier spots for me to be. And I, I loved it. I loved every bit of it, but, uh, but specifically for you guys coming in, you know, um, so George, I, I only knew you as a chief. I didn't know you as a first class and, uh, Olaf, I only knew you as a senior chief. So for me coming in, it was, this is senior and this is chief period. Um, or dude, as you would refer to me. All right. <laughs> Which got stopped pretty damn quick. Leadership rule number one, just <laughs> squash whatever. <laughs> Don't call the senior chief dude. Right? Oh, that should have been like junior boot guy rule number one. Don't call the senior chief dude. <laughs> uh, well, you got you got, you got got it after a while. Oh, uh, yeah. You know what? It, t- it takes a couple of minutes for me, okay? Or at least a couple of times. It was, it was great. <laughs> um, so with you guys, you guys had a, a great – 
uh, relationship in the, in the front office. And, you know, I, I mentioned this to Olaf, you know, I've listened to a bunch of books, including um, uh, extreme ownership by Jocko Willink, uh, you know, how to eat uh, good leaders eat last, you know, how to be a good leader. You know, I have listened to these books and I, I've, I've gone through them because I, I like, I want to be a good leader and, and you guys really set the precedence for that. And I appreciate that. So I guess the, the start question is you guys had a command you had, you supported the shop. So you basically blanketed us, us guys in the shop from the command, you know, it was like, let's keep everything in the shop. And we talked about that yep. for the entire time I was there. I was there for three years and it was keep everything in the shop. Why is that important? <laughs> You want to go, George? You want me to do it? No, you go ahead. Um, well, the, our our idea wasn't. Um, it was it was based on keep things like uh, low key. Keep it keep it. If you can, if we George and I can handle a situation, it was best to keep it in the shop and not have it go up the chain and have it escalate. We knew you guys. We had a relationship with you guys one on one, and it's way better to sit there and, and ostracize you or do whatever we need to do and fix that problem at the lowest level than to have it go all the way up the chain and have it go out of hand and have it out of our, have it out of, outside of our reach and outside of our, where we can control it. Um, for the most part, you know, um, the other thing I, I will say about it is we tried to, to for, the, for the most part, um, treat everybody the same way. If, if, if you, Jason, would have done one thing and then another third class, you know, you're, you're a brother in third class would do the same thing. You do the same thing. You don't, you don't try to play favorites, you know, yeah. no matter what. And, and we just keep it all in house in it as a family. And I think we, we had a pretty good, it built a great esprit de corps in the shop at that time. Plus we wanted, you know, uh, the guys on the hangar deck to respect all the swimmers as professionals. So if it was something we could handle in the shop and it didn't have to go outside of the shop, you know, it, it didn't need to be, you know, Kodiak Island is is a relatively small place and you know everybody knows everything and and the more we could keep in the shop and and present that professionalism on the hangar deck um that's what we tried to do when so, we could yeah <laughs> when you could I, no there, there was there were certain circumstances when I talk about like treating everyone the same there was times you had to also let um you had to be I guess fair in the, in the where the person was in position, and I'm not going to name names, and we're just going to talk about the incident real quick. We had one, um, I believe, third or second class, just happened to get you know early in his career got a DUI, and George and I fought our butts off to keep it as low and as down because it was a mistake. It wasn't he didn't he didn't hit anything. He didn't do anything. You know, it was just one of those things. And maybe a month later, a first class got one. Well, to be honest with you, we were kind of like, well, you should know better. You know, when, when you get to that level and right after we, he saw what we were going through with the, the third class. So that's, I mean, that, that's kind of the thing too, is, is you want to sit there and hold people accountable as well. I, yeah. I think one of the, the main focuses that we had in the shop was we treat you guys like, not to be gender specific or anything, but we treat you guys like men. We treat you like an adult until you, until you made us not. And that very rarely happened, but yeah, I mean, we, we treat you guys with respect and you guys are the same to us. But plus, you know, Olaf and I, we had a lot of conversations. Now he was the senior chief and I was the chief. And we always joked about he had 51% of the vote, which he did, he was in charge. But it was really cool because we ran it together. We yeah. looked at each other's uh, strong points and each other's weaknesses. Now I'm not a hard ass. I'm, I'm pretty, uh, no. if a guy's crying and you know, that's my guy. If a guy needs his ass chewed, you want to go see senior chief Lavelle, you know what I mean? And we had situations where that came up. Well, you know? let's transition to a little story. Thank you, <laughs> Tell your story, you. Olaf. I know you're dying. I know you're dying, dying to throw me into the tail rotor. Go ahead. There was a, uh, we had a first class that was, uh, he was, he was basically transitioning out. He had some, he had some, he had done a long, good tour, but he had gotten uh, a couple bad SAR cases that kind of, you know, took him out of took him out of his own brain a little bit. So George and I talked about it and said, you know, you've given enough to 
to the Coast Guard. So the Coast Guard could get back to you. Gave him kind of an open gangway and let him, um, he was he was going back to school to, to advance his uh, education and do some other things. We were just like, just take care of the night check, um, check on him, make sure things get done and then go do what you need to do. Everything was fine. Well, it was like a week long that neither one of us had seen him. And uh, <laughs> Chief Cavallo, now mind you, I've known George, we went through A school together. I've never once seen George, George upset. I've seen him, I've seen him get ruffled. I've seen him get flustered, but I've never truly seen him get angry. And uh, <laughs> he goes, man, I'm going to, I'm going to chew that guy's ass. And you remember how the office was, you came into the office, you had his desk, my desk, you know, and we had the, the chair strategically positioned so we could uh, basically get you from both sides if we needed to, but. <laughs> oh yeah. I remember it well. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, I'm like, George, I want to see this. I really want to see this. So well, I saw the guy drop in. and do 10 push-ups before you could even enter the office. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> so I said, I, I want Remember to that? We so painted handprints in front of the door and we dropped <laughs> two. So, you know, if we had a lot of visitors that day, we were going to get a good couple of hundred push-ups in. They were huge. Um, so anyway, so he, he comes in, I call him in. He's like, what's up, senior chief? I go, hey. I said, Chief Galal has some things to say to you. So he, I, I said, shut the door. So he shuts the door. <laughs> God love George. He goes, he says the guy's name. He's like, you know, senior chief and I really uh, went out of our way to sit there and make it good for you. And to, you know, we just need you to really like, you know, step up your game and come in. We're not asking you to do a lot. Just come in tonight, check and check on these things like we asked before. You really need to do that for us. You know, could you do that for us? And the guy was like, yeah, chief. And then, then the guy looks at me. I'm like, I, I guess you're done. So he leaves. I said, yeah, shut the door behind you. As soon as he shuts the door behind him, George pops in. He goes, man, I really don't want to get in that guy's ass like that. But, you know, he had a <laughs> <laughs> my job was like down here just drop Dude, that's, 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 that's all the yelling i could get you know <laughs> like but, i said i've never i've never seen you angry well you know if if, if i would have been a chief after i had kids i, I think i could have really risen to be a chief. <laughs> <careful> <laughs> uh, that's so, but good. you know on the on the other side of that we had a guy who needed his ass chewed and uh I, uh, I called the guy in, but before I called him in, um, Senior Chief Lavelle here says, hold on, hold on. So he starts pacing, getting his game face on. Then he kicks the trash can into the wall, does this whole little, Argh! all right, bring him in. <laughs> well, continue it, George. So then I'm chewing this guy's butt. I'm just getting to his ass good. And George, George told me afterwards, he goes, it was beautiful. He goes, like, you were, you were, I was repositioning the trash can. He goes, your face came up. It was just red, just this fury, right? So I'm yelling at this guy, and I'm just getting into his ass, and he starts kind of, like, crying. And that, crying. He was getting honest, choked up. I would, I would up. Say, yeah, he was getting choked well, up. He was, you know, his eyes were watering and I was, like, stopped. <laughs> like, I don't know what to do. I go, George, you got him. And I walked out. I'm like, I can't deal with it. <laughs> I didn't, lose, I, didn't lose, I didn't lose a beat. I'm like, all right, listen, man, you need to calm down. <laughs> that's you really awesome. got his ass, did you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this you know is, what, that's, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was going to say that was, like George has said before, that was, I think that was George and I's ultimate mega strength was we were, we were self-aware enough to know ourselves as well as each other. I know George, I knew George's strength as a leader. I know you know, how, how he leads and he knew how I led. And so we used each other. Like he said, you know, I, I was the hard ass. I came off. It wasn't, it wasn't hard for me. That's just the way I've always been. And George was more of the, the, I used to call him my face guy because I would even bring him around to a, when I had to go talk to officers or things like that, because I, I would get going on a rant and, and start going. Then yeah, George I, I went to all the meetings. Go. Yeah. I would go to all the meetings. What Susan meant to say was, <laughs> <laughs> and then be very tactful and political. But but we both knew that about each other, and uh, we used it. We didn't we didn't hide from it. We didn't we recognized it. We didn't um, we weren't ashamed of it. And and the only one time that and and George, I don't even know if you remember this, but the only one time that that and it was really early, really early on when when George became a chief. I went away for a little bit, and I came back and. The whole shop was like almost like in a coup de gras in, in a coup d'etat type of thing. And and everyone's 
like, oh, we're so glad you're back. So, you know, Chief Cavallo has gone crazy with power and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, what the hell? And so George and I went, I go, George, let's go for a run. So we went that back way in Kodiak, you know, we're just running. I go, George, what the hell's going on? And I was over some stupid like name tags or something. And basically he did what I would have done, but the way I would have done it, he didn't handle it like George, he handled it like Olaf. And the guys kind of like picked up on it. And like, you go from a guy who's like usually laid back and like gets thing going on, on, in, in his motivational way. And he was coming off like me. And, uh, and I went back to the shop. And I had to talk. I said, well, you know what? They were like, you know, if you were here, this is, I'm like, well, if I was here and I told you to do that, what would you have done? Well, we would have done it. Well, then what's the difference? You know, we yeah. still, we, George, and I always still bat, had each other's back no matter what. We never, I never sold George down the river and he never did to me either. So. Which is a, uh, like a, a huge thing because there, there are a lot of guys that you see out in the rate and, and or like in leadership roles that throw the other guy under the bus. And you're like, yeah, yeah, we never did that. No, never did I see that with you guys. You know, another thing we did too is we always led from the front. You know, we wore, we wore dark blue shirts. We, uh, we would pack parachutes. We would do the rafts, you know, because we, we were going to be tested on this stuff too. And we wanted to be able to instruct the, the new thirds, you know. So we, we were a little different than uh, ch- definitely the chiefs on the hangar deck and even some of the other. Um, most most well, ASM chiefs have to stand duty, that, though. Not to, not to slap our, ourselves on the back, George. But I mean, like when, when uh, the, the old CO <coughs> devised a plan to put rescue, helicopter rescue swimmers on the back of the Alpad ships, you know, not only are we deployed in Cordova and cold bay and all these other places he's like let's put him in the back of the uh, on the ships too during the, the crab season well yeah. george and i were like well if we're going to tell these guys to do it we had to sit there and say we've done it too so we were the first ones to do that yeah but we Which also was, had a we also had a commander you know a captain who um also led from the front he came about yep. once a month to the uh, pool with us and i don't know if you were there when he came when you were there jason but yep. He'd always line up next Got to Nelson? Us, off and I and yeah. tell us at least he could try and beat us. But uh, <laughs> and he would do our, he would do, it was our yeah. he would do our two hour extreme workouts. And, the, you know, he, he was definitely uh, um, a little well, out of his uh, league. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? Captain Nelson, Captain Nelson was amazing uh, from multiple aspects for that side, because I mean, heck, one of the I remember flying a SAR case with him. And losing communication somewhere, I think we're in Cordova or that area. And, you know, he gets on the radio. He's like, you know what? Tell freaking district to get me better antennas so I can communicate with them. <laughs> and I was like, holy, you know. And He was great. <laughs> well, and, and just like I, I was going to bring that up, Jason, that he was also one of those. I was like, he was he was routinely on the duty schedule. I mean, you, you yeah. could pull duty and go, oh, who's your who's your duty pilot? You know, it's the CEO. Yeah, he wasn't he wasn't one of those guys that he got to that point to rest on his laurels. And uh, it would have been real easy for him to go from being a helicopter pilot, transition to a C-130 and then just do those, you know. You know, whatever he needed for his, his flight time and, and, you know, log flights. But yeah. he wasn't he was, he was led from the front uh, and, he, um, and he enjoyed flying like I and I I believe that I remember you guys enjoyed flying. You enjoyed standing duty, you know, coming in, getting the cases and. And doing the job. I mean, it's a job we signed yeah. up for. And you guys still enjoyed yeah, right. that. So we did. We did. And 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 I don't know if you remember too, like George and I, like I said, I'm trying not to like beef, beef us up and get our get our hells our heads all swelled, but like we routinely would we, we would work out one of us would always take Christmas and one of us would always take New Year's and let everyone else off because you know, you guys you guys did stand more duty than we did. I think we were like one in six, George, but everyone else was a little bit more. But uh, but we still took like our Cordova trips, yep. like that. Like that was yeah. hard to take. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> one so, of my my guy yeah, George. I was gonna say one of my, my proudest moments was uh, uh, one of our guys were getting promoted. I believe it was Bunch. Was it Jason Bunch who was getting promoted? Remember we got stuck out on a uh, a trainer because he wanted us to to be there and uh, uh, pin on his. Um, yep his new uh, rank yep. and we Check got delayed bros. we got delayed on a training flight that we were both on and uh we got off the helicopter we were in um you know it's it's alaska right so we yep. get out we're in dry suits we're dripping wet 
and we can see over in the hangar that they're doing the ceremony and we just marched right over in dry suits that's right got right that's next right. to a bunch stood at attention and the, the captain's just kind of looking at us he's like hell yeah <laughs> that, 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 yep. i mean I, we we got some kudos from the shop on that one yep. but you know um but those, it, it but those was, things weren't hard to do i mean it, they doing things for for the guys in the shop like that um it wasn't hard to do they they all deserved the the out but whatever we could give them they deserved it i mean they worked hard they worked their asses off for us they did great things um so i mean it, doing things like that i mean that that's a proud moment for us and i'm glad we got to do it but it wasn't hard you know it wasn't that wasn't a, a heavy lift for us because it was more of an honor for us that that he would want us there like that. Yeah. Well, and again, for you guys, just as a third class learning and watching you guys, just everything you did for the shop. And uh, one of the things that I still remember constantly, again, this is coming from Bob Watson, Bob Watson saying, hey, watch those guys, watch them. And you guys would walk into the office. You'd have this conversation. You could see you were mulling about something that either upper command, the C-130 side, uh, 60 side, whatever side was like, trying to, you need to be there to wash the planes. You need to be there to fly the C-130s. And you guys would mull about it. You'd come into the office, you'd shut the door. And then you'd come out and you'd be talking about the plan as you came out. So it wasn't yeah. like one of you was ever at battle without the other one. And I, I, I remember seeing that, like, that's how you communicate on top. And you would always come back to us and say, hey, guys, this is, this is what we're going to do. Does anybody have Ooh. a better idea? And I was like, oh, Man, I, I have no idea. I have no input. But to to watch you guys ask, I that oh, yeah. was impressive to me. I was like, well, man, it, that that's pretty good. We had we had, I mean, we had a lot of um, you know, like you just said, Bob Watson, you know, one of the most decorated rescue swimmers in all the Coast Guard. You know, and he, of course he has good ideas about <laughs> doing things. And, and Will Milam and Jason Bucks yeah. and all these other guys. There was we had a lot of talent in the shop at the time, and and um it, it was it, I I Take it back to like um, when we have sewing projects. Yep. George and I would never like say we want, you know, this is what we wanted. And we give you these, you know, uh, anal retentive dimensions and diagrams. We go, just make it. And you guys would come up with these fantastic covers. You remember when we made the covers for the CDUs? We told you guys to make those. And you guys made these awesome covers for the CDUs in the yep. 60s. It was just, I mean, and that's why we also always used to sit there and say, like if you guys needed to do home sewing projects or anything like that, we wanted you to to do that because that was just practice. That was you were learning how to do it and and figuring things out, and that's just all all part of the job. Right. Um, you know, we also had great first class. We had Bob Watson, Dave Toppy. Um, oh, to Poppy. Uh, yeah. Oh my gosh! You know, you know, we we could go off and fight the big battles uh, in in ops or with the command. Sometimes we could go off. And, and, Sometimes other things yeah. happen. <laughs> come on dave <laughs> but you know what but i joke around but like even like george was saying even the worst things that they did we still trusted them i mean we could we, george and i could go off in fact remember when we went on the motorcycle run i mean who was in charge of the shop then i think it was i think it was to poppy yeah and and watson i think they ran it together you no know, watson was with us remember Oh, that's right. Oh, we just left yeah. to Poppy. To Dave Toppy. Like, wow. Run the station, and, you know. <laughs> He's like, it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right before we transferred, we went on a 10-day uh, uh, Harley ride right around uh, Alaska, and we left, we left, yeah, yeah we left yeah. Uh, one, we took one first class, and we left one in charge, so, which is, yeah. which is a, you know, but well, Dave and, was... And, the, and it goes back to, it goes back to the same thing, uh, like, like we were saying, we never... I don't believe that we ever um, needed to treat to treat you guys like like children. Right. You you gave us and you and you were self self policing like you were mm -hmm. talking about. You're the new third class and how Bob Watson and John Hall and all those guys would take you. Jason Bunch, well, mine would take you under their wing and like correct you on the spot about things. We didn't have to do that. Right. We took care of like they they let us take care of like you're talking about the bigger issues. They let us do that because we didn't have to worry about the, the shop. We knew the shop was a, a well-oiled, well-tuned machine that, you know, and that's why there was a lot of times like if, if uh, things need to be done, we just sit there and just said, all right, you know, take care of it. We didn't have, we didn't, because we could trust you guys. Yeah. And I think that's part of, you know, you want to talk about leadership. 
I think that's one of the, the preambles is you have to, you can't go into a, you can't go into a situation or, or any kind of um, arena or whatever you want to call it without that certain amount of trust. You know, like I said, every, when we went in there, we went in there with the already preconception that we were going to treat you like men, like grownups until you gave us a reason not to. Right. And you know what I'm saying? So yeah. you, if you, if we would have, if we would have went in there and started micromanaging Jason or Will or they would have shut down on us. They would have, they would have, um, you know, we would not, they would not have been as productive. I don't believe as letting them, um, run a little bit free. J George had the best line about you guys ever. He was like, they're all a bunch of wild dogs that we have them on leashes and you gotta let them, you gotta let them loose for a little bit. And every once in a while you gotta jack it, you know, jerk it back. But you know, and that's true. You guys were like yeah. raring to go young guys, just raring to go and have a good time. So why would we, you want to curtail that? Yeah. And you, and you guys didn't micromanage. And I remember the, the trip you guys took out, uh, going gone. It was like, ah, oh, chief and senior are gone. Woo. But nothing actually changed the shop. It was like, all right, just come do your job and then go home. You know, make sure the duty is covered. Make sure all the flights are covered. Yep. Make sure the work is done. And then you do your thing. And, you know, I think there was a couple of days we probably bailed out of the shop early. It's like, you know what? Hey, we're done for the day. Get out of there, guys. You know, we're going to take advantage. The leadership is gone. Cool. But for the most part, <laughs> I would. yeah, every, yeah. but everything was done. It's not like we were, it, we weren't taking advantage of, or of you guys being no. Of yeah. the shop. Well, I mean, Things were that's done. What I mean, so well, and, and if you remember, I mean, George and I would routinely, we were not, we were not ones to sit there. And, and I, I, to this day, I cannot stand like just busy work. Like, yeah. oh, you know, go make, go wrap trail lines for the next, you know, four hours because it's not three o'clock yet. Because we always said to each other, we're going to get our time out of those guys, those guys' asses. You know, we're going to be calling Jason up in the middle of the night going, hey, we got a star case. You yeah. got to come in and you would come in. So it was only it was only right in our mind to sit there. If we could let you guys, especially in Kodiak, when it was sunny and beautiful and you guys wanted to you know, do your thing and, and all the work was done, why not let you go? I don't know yeah. if you remember this, Olaf. There was a couple of days where we had uh, bad weather for weeks on end and then the sun would come out and you and I would stand there in that little bay where they come in with their coffee at seven o'clock in the morning. And as they got out of their cars, we'd go, go home. Go home. Yep. Yep. Go home. And, and you and I did all the work and shit. We worked our asses off that day. Yeah. What, what were we <laughs> like, thinking? holy shit, when 30 guys in the end of the I was like, call somebody back. But in the same thing, you know, we'd call a guy up at three in the morning and tell him to get his bag and he's gone for a week, you know. Yeah. So I mean you had yeah. you had to have that kind of um um situations where you 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 gave a different give and take, yeah. 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 I, as a matter of fact, I, I remember the first time you called me, George. Uh, I was at home, and it, it, I think it was actually 3 in the morning. And I remember the phone ringing, and I'd be like, hello? And you're like, Quinny. I was like, chief? And you're like, get your shit. Get to the get to the base. You got about 30 <laughs> minutes. You're on the next flight out to such and such. I was like, roger that. And it, it, it wasn't <laughs> any question of – it was just go. And, you know, and, but that's what we understood is the shop guys yeah. – um, well, into it, there so. was actually an etiquette of, or, a, or a, <laughs> I, I was wondering if you're going to bring this you up. You talk about that, Olaf, because if you called the wrong guy to go out and he had, and another guy had been, there was like an order of, of who you called, you know, yeah, you, because you, it, you guys give you guys, some like, guy like, three, you guys just rage, raging animals, like wanting to get out there. So like, if we called, like, if we called you twice in a row to go out on a star case, and we didn't go through the other guys like, hey, what's up? Was he your favorite? You know, <laughs> <laughs> I, and I think I think part of that, the other, the other part about, you know, we're talking about leadership. The other part is knowing your people. Yeah, um, we there was uh, <laughs> I remember uh, Jason, I, I, he's a great guy and I'll, I'll sit there and say it. He got mad because of because of the circumstance that we had no no. Um, we had to put him in this in this situation. And I'll never forget. He was in our, he was in our office, George and I's uh, office there. And he kicks the trash can. I'm like, all right, go home. Didn't, I didn't do, I didn't get mad. I didn't get anything because I knew that was an initial reaction. I knew Jason, he was, he was doing it. His initial reaction was this. And then when he came back, he's like, he was like, come back with his head down. He's like, Hey, I'm really sorry. Senior. You know, I kicked the trash can. You know, I, I'll do what you know, what, what you guys are asking me to do and blah, blah, blah. 
and that's it. And we, but I knew that about him, George. Yeah. I knew we knew our people well enough to know that. All right, you're going to have that flare up, you know, every once in a while. But he, but he was a great guy, and he was a great performer, and everything else. And I understood that, you know, that's the way it was. And and you you have to you have to like I said, you have to know your people to a certain extent. I'm not talking about getting into their personal lives and getting into the nooks and crannies, just knowing their personalities and just watching them. I think uh, we said, you remember those little routine uh, shot meetings we'd have just to, to BS and, and do things, you know, yep. a lot of that was just getting to, know, getting to know everyone. Super smart. You know, actually I'll, I'll segue into our, our PTSD stuff because you guys knew all of us so well. And I say, I say that because my very first case that I came back with, the first thing you guys did was sit down with me and, and say, all right, tell us about the case. You know, are, are you good? You know, and as we get talking about it, I'm just kind of telling you the story. But for you guys, it was a debrief. You know, it was that listening to what was going on. And, and I, I don't think I knew it at the time, but you guys were doing your, your assessment to the critical incident stress management stuff because it was a, it was a pretty decent case. And I, I didn't, I, I didn't even know at the time. I remember being on scene, watching a tray line fall out of the aircraft, getting caught on the tail landing and be like, that's not supposed to happen. I've never seen that before. And <laughs> you guys, yeah. And you guys are like, yeah, that good call. You know, this is what you did. This is what you should have done. And it was like, oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. This is like a learning moment for me, the whole, even the debrief. So, well, we you know, again, the, 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 with the PTSD stuff and the, the schism, you know, it starts at the top too. I remember I was coming back. I had a body in the, in the aircraft and I was trying to yank it out of the aircraft. We had landed back at the air station and this guy was in my way. And I was like, Hey, get out of my way. I got to get this body. And it was the captain. He's like, you are right. Cavallo. I'm like, sir, <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> sorry, but, yeah, know, sorry, but, sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, and Olaf will tell you this. It was, it, Olaf hadn't been exposed to it. I think like I had been the, the training part of it, the, the sizzle. Yeah, I, um, I, you know, I, I'm going to jump in real quick, George, is the only reason why you guys that we even had that at, at the swimmer shop was because of George, because I was still in that old swimmer mindset of, you know, suck it up, drive it. And he pushed it hard on me. And, and I'm glad he did. I mean, I saw, I saw initially the benefits and, and everything else. So go ahead, George. Sorry. Well, I'll tell you how it, it really came about was, you know, I was at Humboldt when the 4-9 crashed. Um, actually, I, I was getting ready to go back out again on that plane, and Jamie came in and, and asked to go out on the case. Um, and, and that was uh, the, the Shelter Cove crash, correct? No, this is the second <laughs> crash. This is uh, Jamie Keynes, and uh, they were uh, flying offshore for a sailboat. This is oh, the right. uh, 4 9 6 5 4 9. Yep. And, uh, you know, I actually gave my seat up to Jamie because he was excited, wanted to go on this case. Um, I thought the boat was in tow by a, by a, a ship, so I thought the case was over. But, um, you know, when we lost the crew and we were all pretty devastated, I went through critical incident stress debriefing um, with uh, Kristen Cox and, and you know, it helped me. It helped me a lot, you know, and the, the whole premise of it is getting everybody together, telling your story, listening to other people tell their story and filling in some of the gaps and, and also normalizing it. Right. You know, after World War Two or World War One, actually, um, most of those folks that were over there in World War One got on, a you know, a ship and spent six weeks transiting across the ocean to come back. Well, what do you think they did? They did SISM training. They, they shared. They didn't they know talked. it. Yeah, they, right. they didn't they know didn't. it. No. And, you know, I mean, there was, there was, they wouldn't even, weren't able to even identify what it was back then. But, but um, so by doing that, I learned a lot about myself and I immediately turned around and, and became a peer, um, went through a lot of the training. And um, that's where I was able to, uh, when, I, when I brought it into Kodiak, you know, and, and told Senior Chief about the training I had been through. And a matter of fact, he was my lifeline after the loss of the 4-9. You know, he sent me uh, uh, rescue swimmers. He got on the phone. What do you need? What kind of gear do you need? You know, we lost a whole helicopter. We lost gear. Um, 
a lot of swimmers were ready to throw uh, throw it in. They wanted to quit, didn't want to fly anymore. Yep. Um, but we got them all back up, you know, and, and the, the training is good and it helps. And I actually was a warrant officer when Katrina hit and um, working for a real knucklehead uh, M guy. Uh, a what? Commander, an M guy that I won't, knucklehead? I know. I won't, I won't mention his name because uh, he was such a knucklehead. <laughs> They're all the same. It doesn't matter, George. But, all those uh, guys are the same. They wanted, to, <laughs> they wanted to pull me in to do all the uh, critical stress debriefings for all the rescue swimmers on the Gulf Coast, and he wouldn't allow it. Um, and they had to actually call uh, Terry Blaze, actually called the Admiral. And uh, it was pretty funny because he walked in and he, he wouldn't look at me and he said, I don't know who you know, but you no longer work for me. <laughs> and I got up, got my <laughs> bag of <laughs> and I did, Terry Blaze was I coordinated and did all the sisms for all those rescue swimmers who were, you know, and, and you know this, rescue swimmers don't want to talk to anyone but another rescue swimmer. And by having we don't even want to do that. Group, yeah. What's that? I said, don't even want to do that. that. Yeah. <laughs> so it was it was pretty cool that, that we had that training and we could bring that to, yeah. um, you know, Kodiak because it was. He knew at the time it was needed. Yeah. It was needed. Yeah. And and um, like I said, I, I, I would have never. And and. I mean, I, I'll be quite honest. I mean, I still. I, I think I've told you, Jason, I know uh, George is like, I, I call him my little ghost, the little, you know, the things that pop up at three o'clock in the morning. I don't, I don't think I've had a full night's sleep since uh, uh, 2005, just Jeez. because of all the little ghosts and everything else. You know, we were talking on the podcast about that kid that uh, on at Rockaway Beach, I still see him every once in a while. Those little things, I mean, they get to you. And I, I truthfully believe that like, you know, you change the more you see death and, and trauma and things like that, you, there's part of you that, that shifts, you know, your mentality, your, and uh, for the longest time, I was great about like the dark humor that we do, the joking around and everything else. And that does help. And that is an outlet. And, and, you know, but the swimmers um, they're in our, in our breed of, of our generation, and I hope it's changed somewhat. It, there is, I mean, there is that macho esque, self-sufficient i can save myself i don't need anybody's help type of thing so would you agree george i would and and uh, you know i have a really good example from katrina that uh really solidifies what uh critical and stress management is really all about and i i out of all the ones and i we probably did damn near a hundred of these um groups while i was in the gulf coast after uh um, I was relieved from the M folks and um, the, the and, you know, it's pretty interesting too, because when you get into these, uh, when you're trying to put these groups together, it's always the pilots who are like, ah, I don't need it. I don't, you know, it's not, this is, I don't have to go to this. And I always tell them, I'm like, look, this is for the crew. I know you don't need it, sir, but why don't you just go for the crew? And they're the ones that are winds up, you know, <laughs> getting, getting a lot out of it because, um, yeah. They get in there and then they realize it's so helpful. Um, but the the whole dynamics of getting that group together, with, it's usually two peers, a mental health worker, and then all the people involved. And everybody goes around and talks about where, you know, where they were when they heard about the incident, what was their part in the incident. And so what, what it does is it tries to build um, a, a, a whole round picture of what happened so that you have it in your head. And as you get later in life, hopefully you have all the facts and it's less likely to get PTSD. So that's really the premise of it. And the one time I, yeah. yeah, and the one time I saw it work, there was a crew in there that was talking about, you know, they were coming in and it was an elderly couple on a point of land and it was blowing and it was the hurricane had just passed through, but it was still, um, it was at night and he was devastated. He had left these two people. He said, we were running low on fuel and we were ordered off because there was another helicopter that may be in the area and they thought we were going to hit it. And he goes, and I know those people are dead. Another person across the room stood up and said, uh, nope, I went in 20 minutes later and I pulled that. I know exactly where you're talking about. I saved those two elderly oh, couple. Crap. Now this wow. guy had closure, right? Wow, he would that's never pretty awesome. have had that closure if we didn't have that group. And I didn't see this happen 
I mean, you sometimes you can't tell it's happening, right? Because you weren't there and everybody's filling in the pieces of the puzzle. But this was a prime example. He filled in the piece of the puzzle for this guy. And for the rest of his life, he knows that those two people made it out and, you know, he did everything he could. So it was really a, a cool um, experiment and seeing it happen right in front of your eyes. So that was that is pretty- cool. But, but the, some of the problem is um, you don't have that. You don't have that that um, that other person to say, no, those people are saved or, you know, to give you that, that yeah. final answer. I think it's awesome that that happened. But a lot of times you don't have that. And you have to, you, there, I still think schism and, and those things are great ways to deal with it initially. You have to, I mean, because your mind will, will process it. And, and if you beat yourself up, which we all do, the woulda, coulda, shouldas, and everything else, I, you know, right? it's going to happen. Um, but, you know, like, it, but it's amazing to me, like, how, and, I, and George and I have talked about it, and Jason, you and I talked about it, like, how, you know, we, we all have big cases, and it's not the big cases that uh, they really right. fuck with you. Yeah, no, it's, it's the little it's, ones. It's the little one. George, back to George's little, I got a lot of philosophy from George. One time he asked me, he goes, you, ever, you know what a whale is? I go, yeah. He goes, you ever been bit by a whale? I go, no. He goes, you know what a mosquito is? I go, yeah. He goes, ever ever been bit by a mosquito? I go, yeah, all the time. He goes, see, it's always the little shit that gets to you. <laughs> so that always sticks out to me. I'm like, yep. Little Cavallo, Cavalloisms. Yeah, Cavallo that's, that's, yeah, so true. So true. And, and but, uh, but you know, and those go ahead. Are, no, I was just going to say, and those are the ones that, that you know, they, they, they compound and they compound. You know, I, I've got, I've got you know, uh, traumatic SAR from, when I first came in as a seaman uh, on a 41 footer, there was a, a Cessna that crashed. You know where John Denver crashed in, in uh, Pacific Grove, uh, Monterey? Anyways, we picked up two people. We wound up having to beat a blue shark off a guy is in trails and everything. Pretty, pretty traumatic. And of course, we had to go right back out and look for the, because there's two other people missing. No debriefing, anything else. Yeah. And now I still have memories of that. But the one thing I was going to say is the, the even little things, um, can can kind of square your mind away a little bit um when al 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 yates's podcast about the plane crash that him and i um responded to yeah and him him seeing at the time that he that you during your podcast he was like in his mind at the time he was like i want to be anywhere else but here stuck out to me so much because i remember i thought the same way but i would never admit that i would never because we weren't supposed to admit that we were rescue swimmers. We we're supposed to go in there and first online, you know, and all this stuff. But I felt it, it, it almost like put a weight off my shoulders. Like, you know, Oh, I wasn't the only one that didn't want to fucking be there. You know, <laughs> telling this guy with half a head around you. I'm like, Oh, you know? Yeah. And it really, that, that helped me. So I think this podcast, whether you know it or not, I think that's, it, that's part of the steps too. I think people need to, to accept it. And I, and I don't know. It, it's, it's a fine edged sword with rescue swimmers and any kind of uh, elite service, you know, like George was talking about pilots and, and uh, there's grunts, there's paratroopers, there's SF, there's seals and all this other stuff. But um, you want them. You, I don't want I don't want a timid rescue swimmer to come out and save me. Right. I want the cockiest yeah. big dick rescue swimmer that there is. They just come out there and just, you know what I'm saying? Yes. That's what you yeah, want. Yeah. That's the way we were. Yeah. But by that same rationale, when you have that personality, you don't want to succumb to, I feel, I feel these things because of these bad cases or, or, you know, I'm thinking these or this. So it, it's a, it's a really, it's a, it's a hard double-edged sword. And, and I don't know what the answer is. I really don't. I, uh, I'm dealing with it. I'm sure I know, you know, there's a lot of swimmers out there that are dealing with it. And, and you remember, you know, Craig Dunbar dealt with it, George. And you know what happened? Yeah. We, we lost Craig Dunbar years ago because of it, but, you know, he was I, a classmate I think, of ours, Jason. He, he was a he was a classmate in rescue swimmer school of ours. He went to Air Station Brooklyn, and then he got out, and then wound up uh, killing himself. And Ugh. you know, and that's and that's a sad it's a sad tragic story. And, and I, George and I, every time we talk, he's always telling me about like one more swimmer that's you know off the list. And I'm just like, God. And yeah. that's you and I were talking on our podcast about, you know, that's that's I don't know maybe that's something that needs to be addressed. I don't know. Yeah, but I think, you know, what happens now is as we get older, too, they they say that you're, you, you know, life slows down around you. So 
some of these things bubble back to the top. But they do. You know, by by having your by being communicating with your buddies on it, you know, Olaf and I will get together and tell stories and talk about it. And I think somewhat normalizes it. You know, just the other night yeah. we were talking about, you know, I, I have the same recurring dream over and over again. It's a weird one. And I'm looking in the window of an H3 of all helicopters and everything's in black and white and I'm doing CPR on a woman. Um, but it's like, you know being able to talk to him about that and, you know, and, and he understands exactly where I'm coming from. Right. So it's like, you know, we're doing our own schism here. We yeah. are years later where we're sharing and normalizing and talking about it. And I think a lot of rescue swimmers do that. Um, I hope so. I know, I know so. Uh, you know, like even Butch on one of your earlier podcasts was talking about Butch Flight. you know, it's, a, it is a brotherhood and, yeah. And, uh, you know, he's he's created I know him and a couple other guys have the uh, silver fins where they try to go in and, and um, provide for these guys, too. So, you know. Times are a lot different than they were 20, 25 years ago when, you know, we were using uh, Vietnam era equipment, working out <laughs> of where the pilots didn't even want us holding a yeah. PRC 90 the size of a brick radio <laughs> to try and talk to hey, 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 yeah, I mean I don't know how many times I just threw it I go they can't hear me I, I can't know. hear them I mean how many you know? times did you bang hey Jason when you were when you went through school did they ever uh did you have to put anybody in a in a jungle penetrator no thank oh, god thing. you remember that you remember that yeah. talk about so old Vietnam I, equipment I've Do used them the I, I've used them today like I I know what they are but yeah. I, I am like I'm actually not a fan of the jungle penetrator. That me personally, <laughs> no, like, not, like stupid. No, and, and, why would and, you? Be? You know what? Like, yeah. I've used them in desert, and I'm like, why would? We, there's so much other cooler, better equipment that you would use in the desert. Why would I use a jungle penetrator yeah. here? <laughs> anyway, I know, I know, but I, but that I just that just right when he said that old Vietnam equipment, that made me laugh because I remember us in school having to train with that. I'm like, this I'm never going to use this. And, you know, it was just and the you old PRC nineties and. and the HBO 11s who like every, every swimmer from our generation has a bad back in some case, in some way, because that stupid HBO 11. Yeah. Yeah. Cause we didn't have the luxury of the, uh, the tri Tristar, like, or the Tristar, like Tristar into we the had to swim uphill both ways. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You know, yeah, I, I don't even recognize the equipment anymore when I see these guys. In pictures. Oh my God. Oh, it's Man, I don't even know what the hell. No, it's all, all I, the stuff I, that they've upgraded to is amazing. Uh, you know, I, and, and I was slipping so. out that they had black, they had black shorties, black wetsuit yeah. shorties. I'm like, what, yeah. what do they go to the black shorties? I'm like, yeah. man, yeah, they got those big great Henderson equipment. ones, those, those, those stupid Henderson uh, things that were like three quarters of an inch thick. And like, no matter what you did, you couldn't <laughs> die because you were floating. Especially, especially <laughs> someone with a big ass like me, my whole, all my ass was hanging out because of, ah. Uh, say, tell suit, somebody you got to do an underwater approach, man. I can't. I can't even. Get I can't. My, my I, butt comes at him. <laughs> Grab onto my butt, sir. Grab onto my butt. Uh, oh, that's funny. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I got you guys off track. I'm sorry. No, you're I'm good. Just, you're good. That, that brought me back to. I, I I do think George is right. I do think that the thing is is um. You do. I I think. George hit it on the head perfectly. Is is as we get older, and George, I can speak on. We're the same age. Um, I just look better than him. That uh. It does do. catch up with you. I mean, I, yeah. I think I think that that like when we were doing it at the time. I mean, George, seriously, at the time, besides the major traumatic things like in Humboldt and other things, all those other cases, did they really have as much of an effect as they do now? Because you were working out a lot harder. You know what I'm saying? Like when you start, when your body starts slowing down, your mind starts does nothing but start wandering. Right. So yeah, I mean, and I think I think you always have those cases, you know, that stick with you. You know. Um, kids oh, yeah. for me I mean, and most yep. of us you know um you know i was listening to mike odell tell the his stories you know and yeah. i was actually his roommate when that was going down and and he came home and told me the stories that night and uh, i mean i drop a tear from a glass eye man those, those are yeah anytime there are kids involved you know and i i did cpr and and had quite a few kids and uh, those will those will always stick with you that's that was really hard, hard. But do, do you remember, and here's, and here's the other dynamic. I don't want us to get into this, this uh, uh, paradigm that like everybody is affected by kids, 
because um, we had a case in Kodak and Jason, I don't know if, I don't remember if you were there. I think you were, but what had happened was this Russian family had got on a little, uh, uh, do you remember this George, the little Saner boat? And they went out and got into bad weather. And of course there was a mother, father and an infant. Well, they, they recovered the body of the, uh, the bodies of the mother and father, but, they, but it was a couple of days later before they actually found the infant. And the, the, it, wasn't, it wasn't really a star case, it was a recovery case. And we had to walk out in the shop and say, all right, who can do this? Do you remember that, George? Yeah, yeah, and I think you're exactly right. There are some people who, and, and probably not, I don't think Jason was a father at the time, too. He was, and see, and that's the thing. Probably the very time, helpful. Yeah, and, 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 but, I, but I think if I remember right, there was another case that affected him, that it, 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 the image or the person like, uh, was was reflecting on somebody of a relative or something. I remember he had, there was an effect on him a, a case later. Whereas you, you know, I would have been affected by picking up this baby, and he was like, oh, at the time, it was no big deal for him. I don't want to say right. it was no big deal. It obviously was. It didn't affect him like it would have you or me or anybody else. You know, yeah, with right. kids. No, no. and that was again knowing your people. You know, you knew, yeah, yeah. and also querying which ones were able to do certain things. Well, and and we we actually threw it out there. You remember? Because we said, who can do this? You know, we didn't just yeah. select and direct, hey, you have to go do this. I mean, we would have we would have had to at one point, but you know they they knew themselves well enough to go, yeah, this, you know. So and like you said, he didn't have kids at the time. He was a young go getter and so Went out no and, kids. And did but, it, it, well, the point I'm trying to make is like we get into this this um we paint the same picture on everybody and not everybody's painted the same. I mean I it does something will affect you something will affect you whether it's you know you pick you pick up a uh, I'll, I'll give you one scenario that in uh in monterey we, we had a lot of floaters and a lot of you know things like that and uh, and <laughs> this may get a little bit crass so what viewer listening discretion is advised um there was there was this there was this girl who got swapped off the uh, the surf and we all know like after you've been in the water for some time you know you start bloating and you start getting kind of nasty and things well when we pulled up on her she, her her ass end was up and it, it was almost in the same position like the old typical the playboy um yeah. you know how they do the playboy ever like with her bents down yep and i could never look at that for the longest oh i don't say never but i couldn't look at it for the longest time afterwards i got over after a while you know what i'm saying but, uh, <laughs> But, but that affected me just because of that, because I would, I would always sure. associate that position with that, with that little, that SAR case show. And then those kind of things. So like I'm saying, we can't, we can't paint one picture because everybody is different and everyone does get affected by things. I'm not saying that, you know, everything affects you because there are things that they don't. Right. You know, you, Jason's, there, you, do it. you know, you know, he, uh, for the longest time, didn't tell his, his wife about his situation or his, you know what he did in the in the coast guard and and uh mm -hmm. and i think it's important now that you're telling her probably is helpful yeah. uh, um right for me it is absolutely and it, it's oh, it's yeah. funny actually because when i when i start telling my wife and and my wife listens to every one of these episodes and one of the things she, she has come back to me and says she's like it blows her away that you've got guys like yourselves i'll even throw mr lonnie mixon who flew in vietnam that has such a vivid memory of specific cases that we've done. And it's like, oh. yeah, those stand yeah. out to us. And those are the ones that really have made the impact. And some of them that we can talk about, Mike O'Dell being one of them, you know, he didn't talk about it forever. It, for him to come on and share it with the world, that's a big deal. And there's not enough of the, hey, thank you. And I appreciate that because I needed that. You talking about Al Yates, Olaf saying, this is how I felt. And you're like, holy shit. I, I felt the same way, you know? I mean, yeah. that's, that is a big I, I, deal. It, that blew me away. It, it, and, and it was such, it was such a, like I said, it such a silly little statement that lifted like a little bit of a weight off my shoulders from all these years that to know that Al was feeling the same way that I was, I thought, you know, I thought Al was Johnny like Iron Man and he could just, you know, cause that's the way, you know, Al's a very, subdued and, and cool dude right so you know after we got done i had to go on to complete the rest of my duty and he went home 
so I didn't know. And we never really talked about it afterwards or anything, you know? So, yeah. So it, it absolutely helped me knowing that I wasn't the only one that felt like that. And, well, and your wife's I mean. after like that. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, your wife was that's right. <laughs> you, guys, you guys do this all the time. Come on. I think, I think <laughs> this is what we did at work every day. Yeah. But no, no, I, I think I, 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 your wife, I'm going to say something, then I'll let you go. Right? <laughs> your, your wife was actually right. I mean, there are, we do have those, those memories that they're, you know, and tell me that like there, every once in a while, you'll get a whiff of a smell and it brings you back to a certain oh, yeah. positive or negative, you know, but yeah. it does. And, and the smell is like the longest lasting memory trigger. And, and it just, that, that vivid things that you could, that you could go into on certain cases and, and sometimes it's cool and sometimes it sucks. So, all right, George, go ahead. Well, that's what I was going to say about your podcast. I think it's like all the swimmers, especially the ones that have retired now and are moving on, have these like little secrets of, of that we're carrying with us. And I listen to all your podcasts because to me, it's like another way of, of normalizing and hearing, you know, hearing Mike O'Dell or and some of these other folks tell their stories. It's like, wow, OK, they're, they, they feel the same way I do. So yeah. in, in a sense, these podcasts are I find them very helpful. Um, yeah, I think I think it's a great service. I, I will I would recommend this, too. Um, is, you know, along with the uh, the PTSD and everything else, um, make sure some of these things get, you know, when, when you leave the service, if you, especially if you make a career in the But a lot of this on the VA side um, can help you in the long run um, with, you know, benefits and, and uh, uh, your ratings and things. I mean, don't don't just suck it up, you know, getting getting a rating on, on um, with PTSD. I mean, I don't know a swimmer that, hasn't been operational that doesn't deserve it, you know, some kind of rating on PTSD at, at some level. Yeah. So but you can also, you can also like, as a, a we call them rescuing the rescuers being uh, peer supporters. Like I was when I was working with the SISM teams. And when I got out of the coast guard, I actually uh, started working. I did AmeriCorps. I did a year of, of national service and I was working in um, um, taking veterans into the parks and we were removing evasive uh, weeds and and you know it wasn't really about removing the evasive weeds we were taking air force navy coast guard marine i mean we were taking all this, these guys 20 of them going into the forest for five six hours and removing these weeds well what do you think they were doing they telling were stories to, telling stories and they were sharing um but it was a tough year for me by the time i was done i had you know, taking in a lot of their stories and, you know, I mean, um, snipers, they're the worst. Those guys see everything right through the scope, right up. And, you know, um, so I, I finally had to, uh, they wanted, you know, I, I went on and, and did a few more years managing groups, not getting, taking them out anymore, but managing the program, um, through the Washington VA. And I finally had to step away from it. I said, okay, I've, I've done my time. I'm done. But it, 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 compiles on you hearing all these stories but it was amazing to watch because you could watch a navy guy or or, or an air force guy and a coast i mean they could cross share um their stories and normalize them between each other too so it's not so much just rescue swimmers with rescue swimmers yeah. and that's why the program is so successful you get in there like i said pilots usually don't want to go in especially army pilots and the minute we get them in the room they're the ones standing up, blabbering off all this stuff. And I did this and I saw that, and this was affecting me this way. The guy didn't even want to come into the room, you know? And <laughs> yeah. um, so Here he is, it, yeah. Opening you know, up. we even brought support crew people in sometimes after Katrina, you had people that were, you know, making the meals, but also seeing the bodies come off the helicopter. We brought in those folks into the room too and did them. So it was really cool to get all those different people in and all those stories and everybody sharing. Um, hopefully down the line, it, it did mitigate some of their PTSD. Yeah. I, I want to do one other thing, just kind of tie the two things we've been talking about together. One of them leadership and then the other one of the PTSD. And the reason hey, I want to say one thing in, about the Yeah, go ahead. I, I, the, only, the only thing, the, the, other, the, the other side I was going to add to is, is not... Um, the not treated and that's there, there's that hazard of, of 
going off to the, the deep end and, and doing some other crazy stuff. Like I told you, I told you on the podcast that, you know, post Coast Guard, I went out and joined a three piece motorcycle club and rode hard and did a lot of crazy shit. You know, that's I was and I was looking for that bonding that, that you would achieve. And that a lot of that came from like trying to get back to something that I had and that normalcy at that time was was part of it. And I think that people have to watch, you know, just taking it to the extreme on the other side, you know, by not getting take, you know, because it's real easy to sit there and go, I'm just going to ride hard and ride fast and leave everything behind me, you know, and, and I think that that it, that needs to be addressed as well. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. No, you're good. I, I, I totally agree with you. And, and that's why I'm, like I said, I wanted to kind of tie the two in together with the leadership and uh, and the PTSD stuff. And, and I say that because, you know, I came back from my first case and you guys sat down with me. I came back from the galaxy case and you guys sat down with me and the galaxy case affected me more than my first case. And for multiple reasons, but one of them was, I remember being on that adrenaline high. And we talked about it with Steve's case where he went out and did, had a super killer case, saved the lady. And then on his way back, grabbed the dead guy out of a uh out of an airplane out of the water and it it messed him Mm -hmm. up and and i remember coming back from the galaxy case a week later standing in my shower and crying and and it was like what what is wrong with me right now and i remember coming in and, and just you guys were a support for me that whole time fast forward like let's say maybe three four years i'm on a case i get called out two people that got rolled in the surf this is out of humboldt and uh, I'm pulling a dead girl out of the water and I'm, I'm bear hugging her to the beach. And I remember laying her down on the beach and I, I vividly remember her face even today. And this was years ago. I didn't have a phone call. Yeah. There was nothing after that. You know, the other guy that was on the other crew ended up picking up a, a little girl and did CPR on her. Both the, those two victims passed. We, him and I talked about it, but that was it. There was no other debrief. There was there was no, and, and I don't want to totally hammer the command on that. It's not my intention, but there was nobody there to talk to us. I mean, I remember going home, drinking a couple of brews, and sitting back and just like, what just happened? And well, that, you know, so I, there is I a would, difference. I would, I would, I would equate that to um, like when George and I came to the swimmer program, and and George, and I, you know, he mentions it. I mentioned it. And we joke around about. There was a time when uh, pilots did not support the rescue swimmer program. They they would they would flip a coin if they're going to take a pump or they're going to take a swimmer. You know, yeah. was, so it was it's a, it was a very slow transition to get to the point to where, you know, now they're always taking swimmers and they're always you know doing this thing. And I think I think it's it's a mindset with and I believe that was schism. I mean, if if you have this mindset of um, suck it up, drive on, that's your job, or people don't understand too that, you know, like we, like we were just talking about before, it's not necessarily the, the biggest or the goriest cases that really right. screw with your mind. It could be bear hugging a female out of the surf or, or other things that, you know, nobody knows. And without talking or debriefing, nobody's going to know. And I think, I think everyone, and I, and I think, I think it, correct me if I'm wrong, George, but really they should have some kind of debriefing ever after every kind of case like that, just to sit there and see where the person's at. Correct. I, I, yeah, right. Usually right in the beginning, when somebody comes back, it's called a check-in. You kind of see, you know, Hey, drink some water. How are you feeling? Within the first 24 hours though, you want to have actually uh, get everybody together and debrief the whole thing. If possible mission, um, if the mission allows for it, but you know, it's like uh, when, when they lost uh, Hilo in Hawaii, um, yeah. I was out of the Coast Guard um, and the rescue swimmers had uh, um, shut the door. They weren't letting any of the, uh, the touchy feely people in. And I got a phone call and um, re- requested to go to Hawaii. Of course, I had to become a, a, an auxiliarist for uh, 48 hours, which was a dark part of my life. I was actually <laughs> uh, I ran down to the local auxiliarist. And they did it was a, a little, Commodore. Uh, Commodore. Yeah, they did a little. <laughs> and uh, uh they gave me a, a, a t-shirt a shirt with uh silver uh emblems on them i don't know what it was but 
uh, that way the Coast Guard was able to bring it. And they flew me to Hawaii. But you know what I did is I called Scott Harris and I said, Scott, I'm coming. They want me to do a debriefing there. And I said, the only way it's going to work is if you validate me. And and he said, dude, I got you. I got you, Caballo. And he he did. <laughs> and I walked in, man. The door got unlocked. I came in. I talked with the swimmers. Um, I explained to him what SISM was all about. And I told him, I gave him the same party line. I go, it may not be for you guys. Help the other guys on the hangar deck. And, of course, most of the shop went through the SISM. Um, and uh, so the, 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 you know, the peer to peer works and we use it every day in the, in, as uh, swimmers and former swimmers, we're still doing, I mean, this is peer to peer. So I, I it, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a great program. And, and I was fortunate that they kept using me um, and I had history, right? I was through uh, two helicopter crashes in Humboldt. And um, so, you know, I, it worked for me and I, and I could take that out and try and help other people with that. Yeah. And everybody else and, that, and that's I, listening, I, well, like throughout the world right now, like I, you know, we, the three of us could sit here and say, we, I, I don't know what they're doing in Norway or Australia or New Zealand, but this stuff works. And, you know, as a leader, uh, take your people, know, like understand your guys and, and what they need. Ask. Like it's, there's no harm. Now, if you're, if you're afraid that maybe you're too high in the leadership, then ask the, the middle guy, say, go, go check on, go check on him, go check on her. No, I, well, but see, I think too, there is no too high in the leadership because all that shows is caring for your people. And, and, yeah. you know, I mean, it, if, if the CEO of, a, of an air station comes down and he actually sat down with the rescue service and, hey, I really am concerned and was genuinely concerned, I think that shows, Tr- tremendous kudos on his part and you know and, and compassion and empathy for his people so i don't think i don't think the rank thing has as much to play into it but just a consistency about like you said you know knowing your people and knowing when to do it i think when you know i, I don't think it's just a problem with with uh the coast guard or anything else i mean look at look at the guys coming back from uh, the desert they get like a 30-day get back into the civilization world you know, they, they, to debrief, they, they're, they're, let's be honest, they're like living like gods over there. You know, they got life and death in their hands every day. Yeah. And then they come back here and then they're, they're expected to maintain some kind of normalcy and, you know, just give all that, give all that other shit up. There was a guy in, in, in my former club who, uh, when, when I first met him and like, and George, I were talking about this before, like the swimmer and, uh, the only ones I really got along with were like the combat the guys who saw shit were the ones that you like, you get along with. Cause like, you know, you know, I don't know what he went through and he doesn't know what I go through, but you know, you guys went through some shit. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So, um, but this guy had, he had been in the army 12 years and 10 of it was overseas in different, cause he would, he would go to one unit, get deployed, do his thing, get transferred, go to another unit, get deployed and it was he did that for 10 years and he was and he was like the the door the door shotgun guy and he he saw some shit but um he was telling me that all, all they do is when they come back to to um conus is is you know you got 30 days you only know, do this little you know alchemist damish you're no longer over there give us your guns and your weapons and lead a normal life and that's that's a, that's a different mindset that's a different um right. that's not taking that i mean because it they should be, you know, debriefing these guys and, and they should be debriefing the swimmers. They should be um, paying attention to that. Well, I talked to when I was working with the veterans uh, in, you know, doing the, the weed removal in the parks. Um, what they, kind of weed, George? Uh, evasive, <laughs> evasive, very evasive. Oh, Scary right, stuff. Right. It's legal Scary up here, stuff. so it's good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Now it's legal here too, but uh, oh, okay. you know, um, they said that a lot of times that they, they'd they'd be on a mission and lose six seven guys and come back, and it was you didn't have time. It was clean your gun, you know, get a meal, and we're turning around in six hours and going back out. So right. there, you know, that happens where there's not an opportunity to uh, to have that debriefing, um, and I think you know, fire departments, uh, police. Coast Guard and and a lot of these other organizations are getting really good about doing 
um, debriefings and bringing these groups of people together and having them share and talk about it. So, um, you know, operationally, I, I think for a lot of those soldiers, it just can't happen. Well, I, I mean, you could say the same thing about rescue swimmers too and crews like that. Because if we had, if we had a, a major SAR case and you come back and you have to go back out and go look for the rest of a boat crew or look for the rest, you're not going to get debriefed then. You're going to go back out, yeah. you know, get, get your shit together and go back out. But when you get back, you should be debriefed. You know what I'm saying? Well, look at, look, look at I, I think there's always time to do it. Yeah, Jason right. was in Humboldt, what, four or five years after I was there, well, yeah. using two helicopters. And that, um, that matter of fact, they made us go through uh, SISM twice. The the command, they thought that two times would be better than one, which was really annoying. If once is good, not. two times yeah. is better. <laughs> no, it's not. But here, Come on, military. Here you, go. <laughs> here you go, five years later, let's say five, six years later, Jason's there, a whole new command, and they just forgot all about all that training. And, you know, it's, yeah. I don't know and who that's was there and what the dynamics were, but at that, I think it's in place at all units now. I'm, I would hope it's part I, of their, I don't know. Uh, their operating procedures, but I would hope I would hope that uh, they've got something you know in in uh, the manual for that kind of stuff. I mean, it's you know, but but I think I think it's 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 paramount on not just the commands. I think it's paramount on the the, the middle management, the the yeah. AST. Because uh, you don't have ASMs anymore. AST chiefs <laughs> and first that was a dig to, right there. To demand it. <laughs> <laughs> to, to demand it, and and to, right. you know, they they need to they need to step up. I mean, the command in the Kodiak wasn't pushing for us to do CISM. It was it was Jorge. He was the one pushing for us to to get it into the shop and, and make it work. He was the one doing it, yeah. and and uh, he was leading the charge. You know, I commend him for that. So I I. Whether the command wants to do it or not, I think, you know, that's one of those things that you can, you got to take care of your people. And if you, if you take care of your people, they'll take care of you and they'll take care of everyone else. And uh, it, it, you know, it'd be great if the command supported it and everything else, but by the same rationale, it doesn't have to be because especially like, like George was just saying, there's, there's other avenues in, in, at, around air stations and, and small boats and everything else. You can get CSM training at, or, or, or somebody like at a, at a fire department or something like that, I'm sure. Is that right, George? Yeah, yeah. Okay. You can. I think the Coast Guard has come a long way, though. I think I think it's it's pretty... Well, in, 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 yeah, it's come a long way, but you're just talking about how you had two plane crashes, and they did CISM twice, and then Jason gets there four or five years there, and they didn't. They go right back to your and I early days of not yeah, doing well, shit. It's true, it's true. I mean, I, so I, really, I, have they gone... Kind of have they come a long way? Yeah, that's true. You You're know, right. I, but again, I, that's that's that changing of the guard and and new you know guys coming in going out. We had it in Kodiak because of all the stuff that you had gone through, you, the, both of you. And then when I got to Humboldt, that you know maybe oh I I, I, I know, had nothing to do with it. I was just following George's example. Nice. <laughs> all right. Uh, but I mean, that's you know, like that, that whole changing the guard thing, though. It's like you just you lose that. You don't you don't have that yeah, anymore. So. Um, well, and, and again, and we're talking about network. we're talking to guys around the world too. So, you know, the guys in in Norway do some crazy stuff in, in the North Sea, and then you've got guys in Ireland that are that are going in North Atlantic that are just getting some crazy stuff. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, everybody that's out there needs to be able to talk to somebody. When you come back from a big case, a little case, something that's there, have a support group that you guys can talk to. I know, and that's and, what we're getting. And, to. Yeah, well, and I think the other thing, and the, the the paramount is people that did what we do and do what you do is is uh, we need to talk to us because I wouldn't talk to I wouldn't talk to some Giacomo that's right sitting with us sitting there in a tie going, well, tell me, uh, tell me, uh, how does this affect your dreams with your mother and everything else? Yeah, uh, eat a oh, I won't say that. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Um, <laughs> but you know, it, it, there's like what what George was saying about you know that trusting of of swimmers talking to swimmers you know and and talking to the combats you know uh, uh, snipers and and that whole that whole um like we were talking about in the podcast there's something not right with rescue swimmers there's just something isn't right and i, I, I think it's across the board on any elite service that that we have to we have to we're we're okay to talk to those kind of people 
you know, psychos, no psychos. I, I firmly believe that. So we need, we need to talk to other psychos. You know what I'm saying? Yep. And we're not going to talk to the normal people because that, they'll never understand what we do or why we do what we do or did. Right. And that's why they got smart and they made quite a few rescue swimmers peers. Right. So we were mm -hmm. always in the room. I know during uh, Katrina, um, I, I would organize a lot of the, uh, the, the SISMs. And if they had air crews with a swimmer, I would go in and be the peer. I had a lot of different peers, but I always made sure that if there was uh, swimmers in the room that I was in there because uh, otherwise that wasn't going to work. Yeah. So now, it would be interesting. It would be interesting to find out after Katrina and, and Andrew and all those other ones, if, if that program stayed in effect, you know, awesome. obviously it, 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 it humbled for, for Jason when he needed it. And I would be interested to find out if, if down in New Orleans and, and uh, Clearwater and all those other air stations that, uh, and even the Smumbo stations that did they, did they continue on with that? You know, that would be, that'd be telling. Because it's so a, it's a I, sad I, I hope it's out there. That, I, I hope it's out there for I everybody. Do I do too. Um, I, I, you know, I, 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 I used... do not want. Yep. Go ahead. I, I just do. I don't want people to turn out like George and I. We're messed up. <laughs> we're broken. We're broken old men. No way. Not a chance. <laughs> we're, mentally <deficient. laughs> we're mentally deficient. I mean, we got, we got ghosts, but yeah. I mean, but seriously, the, there's no reason in the world for it. There's yeah. no reason. That, I mean, people can be helped if, if the, there's avenues to get help. And that's, I think that's what George is saying is like, you know, the SISM program is, is the first line of defense against turning out like George and I. Yep. Yep. Right, George. I agree. <laughs> I just, want, I just want to admit that you're messed up. That's all. That's <laughs> for me to you know, you, <laughs> I, I, I still think you get 51% of the vote. Uh, uh, I'm still 51% psycho. I get that. Uh, <laughs> hey, George. Oh. Hey, I got, I got a real quick thing for you. Uh, do you remember in the Chiefs Academy when you took, we took that personality test and, and it was, I don't know, Alpha, Beta, Monkey, Tango, Oatmeal, Day whatever seven, it was? I think. I think we were, Jay, she said, how many? Um, we uh, yeah we all took the but test. But you remember there was only the swimmers that got that that one thing. Yeah, and and she said, yeah. "Oh, you must be a rescue swimmer because the person you know yeah. the Briggs Myers test. That's what yeah. it was. We took the Briggs Myers test, and it I, seemed I like I don't know why they just don't do that in the beginning when you get recruited. It's like oh, we're gonna do this <laughs> test. Yeah. Oh, this is where you need to go. What well, yeah, at my tattoo shop? You know what I got? I got what what are those things called? The uh, the Rocher. Is that what they are? The the, the ink blots. I don't you know what I'm know. talking about? Nope. You, you, you know what, nope. when they do the psychological test and they hold up like the ink blots and like you have like, what do you see in this thing? Oh, right. yeah, yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I see a butterfly. I, I see a, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have those all over the, the my uh, my ceiling in my tattoo shop. So I'm just waiting for somebody to go, hey, why do you got a, a picture of a uh, a woman eating the head of a baby? I'm like, oh, you're done. You're out of here. <laughs> 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 <I guess. laughs> uh, oh, my gosh. You know, guys, I, we, we've been on for a long time. I, I, I really appreciate you coming on and kind of sharing a, a little bit Dude, of I how, appreciate you doing this. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you guys were, were great mentors for me as far as leaders, leadership. Uh, and, and then Thank even you. with the critical incident stress stuff, you know, how things were in Kodiak. Um, and just, you know, I can't emphasize it enough for everybody that's listening around the world have somebody to talk to, like talk to your peers. Absolutely. If you have a case, it, you know, everybody wants to have that man card. Everybody wants to be, I'm the tough guy. I, I don't need it. Don't worry about it. Just have a conversation. You know, I, I'm not yeah. telling you to go get liquored, but ha sit down and have a brew. Now li liquor boys. helps too. I'm not going to sit there and say not to, but uh, <laughs> right now I know citizen <laughs> says don't get liquored. No, but it, it, if the three of us had come back from a case or one of us comes back from a case and, and the three of us are sitting down with a brew, you know, uh, drink up. Enjoy. Well, sometimes that's the easiest way. They, they yeah. You know, you can you're relax. You're like, let's have a beer. As yep. long as you're not getting like trashed and like going, you know. Every start, night. Start going off on the deep end. But yeah, yeah, but I agree. I mean, that's, that's sometimes that's the easiest way. And that's the, the way to smooth into that that peer counseling is when you're like, hey, man, let's, let's go have a beer. And, let's, you know, and they say, hey, so how was the case? And you start talking. That's all you need to do. I mean, that's it. and like you said, it, it, there's no weakness. And, and I'm learning that more and more is like, there's no weakness in, in talking about this shit. Right. 
you know, for the longest time, I mean, I thought, you know, it was, you know, it was, it was, you know, you're supposed to suck it up, drive on and be the hard charger, but there's no weakness in this, you know, no, I'm still, I can still beat Georgia. No, nah, probably not, but I mean, <laughs> you know what? No. It was pool fight club. <laughs> yeah. pool fight club. Don't talk about pool fight club. Pool fight club. I love it. <laughs> Well, you thanks for having us on, man. Right? I tell you, I, I appreciate, like I said, I listened to all your podcasts and uh, Thank you. I find them very helpful to uh, everybody sharing their stories. So it's great. I love having you guys yeah. on. Thank you. So. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyway. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of here. Go. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Real Rescue Podcast. Please take a minute to like, subscribe, and hit that share button. I'm pulling chocks and taking off. But before I go, if anyone out there has a rescue story they would be willing to share, I would be humbled and honored to have you on as a guest. Or if you have any questions about rescue or anything else we talk about here, send an email to jason at therealrescue.com that's jason at t-h-e-r-e-a-l-r-e-s-q dot com you can also check us out on our web pages therealrescue.com our facebook page and our instagram page at the real rescue again a special thank you to all of you standing on the watch today always remember when that star alarm goes off those in distress are praying for a miracle they are going to get you. Until next time, fly safe and swim hard. <laughs>